I know you didn't come to hear me speak, and I know some of you had to leave early, so without further ado, I won't delay this anymore. I'll turn it over to Professor Josh Black. Let's introduce our speakers. All right, hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Very good. Good? Okay, welcome to our second event of the semester. We're very excited. We are very honored with two great guests. First, Professor Michael Krause from George Mason. He was my professor not once, but twice, for both legal ethics and jurisprudence. And I intentionally took his class, knowing they would be the toughest classes of the year, but I wanted to have him again. Uh, so you are very, very fortunate to have him here today. So we talk about Atticus Finch as a lawyer. Uh, Michael has been teaching at George Mason since 1987. In 1994, he was the first winner of Professor of the Year. Um, he studied at, at, at Yale, at uh, oh, University of Sherbrooke, how do you say that? Yeah. And at Carleton University in Canada. He clerked on the Canadian Supreme Court. And I'll make him blush, last year's daughter clerked on the United States Supreme Court for Justice Scalia. And his son is an officer in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, the guy is a great great family. He says he loves motorcycling across the country almost as much as he loves being a law professor, and I can attest to that. Uh, he teaches torts, products liability, uh, jurisprudence, legal ethics, and he has a expertise in a wide range of areas. To comment is Professor Jim Paulson. Say hi. <laughs> he got his bachelor's degree at TCU, his law degree from Baylor, his LLM from Harvard. Uh, he's an expert in civil procedure, family law, jurisprudence, legal history, legal research and writing, and marital property. Um, he's very well read. And ask him about this later, he's the only living officer of the Republic of Texas. <laughs> civil officer? The only living civil officer of the Republic of Texas. He actually has a commission from the Republic of Texas as a sovereign. You can ask him about that later. Without further ado, I'll turn this over to Michael Krause, who will be talking about Atticus Finch as a lawyer. Michael, thank, thank you so you much. Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Josh for inviting me. It's always great to see a former student who's uh, now in the academy. Um, I'm a fairly frequent Federalist Society speaker, but I've never talked about exactly this subject, so I put it together just for this event. Uh, and I'm pleased that uh, Josh felt it uh, would be of interest to uh, you all. I've usually talked about much more, you know, um, cogent, day-to-day, -day modern debate topics, um, Supreme Court cases or international law issues, um, and the like, and so it's um, good both to speak about a legal ethics issue, which is timeless, and also to speak about uh, somebody who uh, uh, I discovered as a high school student, and I, when I teach legal ethics as I do this semester, I'm always happy to see that even my current students, obviously way younger than, as young as my children, have uh, still have also discovered Atticus Fitch, so um, uh, a, a timeless event, a timeless subject that I'm happy to do talk about this. Um, and what I want to do, let's see how this, there we go. Um, I'm going to um, uh, base my talk about Atticus Finch and whether Atticus is a lawyer that we should emulate, a lawyer that we should strive to be like. Um, on notions of lawyering that I find uh, uh, extremely useful that I use in my own legal ethics class and that uh, you can find in a really interesting book by Tom Schaffer of Notre Dame and uh, Bob Cochran of Pepperdine, uh, which is a, a book, the second edition of which was published in 2009, um, called uh, Lawyers, Clients, and Moral Responsibility. And in this book, Schaffer and Cochran start, as I do in my legal ethics class, by sketching out the tremendous dissatisfaction that lawyers currently have with their job. Um, there's an increasing uh, degree of substance abuse, there's an increasing degree of depression, there's uh, uh, an increasing percentage of lawyers who regret that they um, have the job that they have, who wish that, who hope that their children do not enter into the profession that they entered into, etc. And this kind of uh, crisis uh, perhaps that's too strong of a word, but this kind of malaise, uh, Schaffer and Cochran uh, say, uh, can be really sketched to a lack of conscientiousness about the type of role that lawyers play, that there are different kinds of roles out there, and many lawyers just sort of float into one or another without being self-conscious about it, without, without um, uh, uh, consciously choosing the kind of lawyer that they want to be. This is going to become relevant to my discussion of Atticus. I'm not the, I'm not just giving you this spiel as a uh, general legal ethics matter. Um, so uh, generally, and I put this on the board here in a messy way, but here it is in a neater way. Uh, this is just your everyday lawyer uh, in, the, in, the, in the picture there. Now what kind of lawyer is this going to be? And 
Schaffer and Cochran um, structure their book by imagining essentially two independent variables that a lawyer has to choose, uh, 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 both of which a lawyer has to uh, uh, cope with. And the lawyer has to figure out, number one, uh, in his relationship with a client, is the ultimate control going to be with the client or is the ultimate control going to be with the lawyer? And number two, when the, when the lawyer is uh, dispensing services to the client, should the lawyer consider that only the client's interests matter, ethically, morally? Uh, or should the lawyer consider that both the client's interests and interests of third parties, whether it be an adversary or other third parties, actually have some ethical import to the solution? And the, um, obviously, if there are two independent variables, that leads to a two-by-two two grid. So four different types of lawyers that uh, the authors see as being possible. Uh, um, I'll very sort of briefly deal with all four of them. Uh, it'll be the fourth one, the friend, that the that that, that Schaffer and Cochran and I agree with them. Obviously, uh, that's why I use their their, their book. But Schaffer and Cochran uh, believe that the friend is the type of lawyer that leads to both an ethical practice and a more personally fulfilling practice, a practice we should emulate, a practice we should admire. So let me just briefly go through this now. Unfortunately, I have to switch screens. That's the neat version. The messy version is up here, so you can, if you haven't internalized this, you can, you can continue to follow it in the uh, subsequent screens. Um, so the godfather lawyer is uh, the lawyer who controls uh, the um, uh, uh, relationship, and it's a relationship where only the client counts. The goal here is victory, as victory is defined by the lawyer. It's usually defined in a very material sense, and of course you you know, you remember the uh, the story from uh, from the movie where um, where the Marlon Brando character receives a request from a has been oops from a has been actor to um, to get a part in a movie, and the director has declined him the part in the movie. And he comes to see the Godfather, and he says, as one would come to see a lawyer, in fact, the Godfather is sitting behind a desk just as one would come to see an attorney. I've got a problem. I'd like to get this. I've got a goal. I'd like to get this job. And, uh, and the uh, Godfather says, leave it to me. What are you going to do? Don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about it. Leave it to me. And, of course, uh, as you know, the, uh, the director uh, wakes up uh, uh, shortly thereafter one morning, and uh, on his bed beside him, Right beside him is the severed head of his prized uh, racehorse uh, with a little note indicating where this head came from. And, of course, um, the client uh, does, get the, does, get the, uh, does get the acting job. Um, the second figure down here is uh, probably unknown to you. Um, uh, you, know, you know who Marlon Brando is, but you probably don't know about um, uh, Judge John Noonan. He's a really interesting guy. Part of what I do in, the, in these Fed Stock talks sometimes is just to introduce students to things that I think might be of interest to them, and who knows, maybe uh, the mud will stick to the wall and one or two of you will decide to look this, these people up. But Noonan's a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals judge out in California, and a really interesting scholar in his own uh, right. And he's, uh, he wrote a, a, a wonderful uh, description of a very famous early 20th century case, a case that happened, I think, in 1909. It was a pretty remarkable case because one of the one of the parties was actually represented by Louis Brandeis, future Supreme Court, uh, who would thereafter become a Supreme Court justice, etc. But um, Noonan wrote about a uh, a will dispute between two brothers. Brother came to see an attorney, and he thought he wasn't sure, but he thought his brother might be misbehaving. The attorney said, "I'll take care of it." Wrote a lawyer's letter to this other brother. Um, the client brother actually ended up writing a letter to his to the to the advert to his adversary to his brother saying you know I really sort of apologize for this it wasn't this wasn't my choice of words the phrases are such as in a legal document I have felt obliged to sign because he did have to sign it but they're very far from representing my feelings towards you let us try to agree it would be much pleasanter your affectionate brother Ned Warren um, the upshot of this uh, letter was uh, of the of the of the lawsuit was uh, dramatic and sad. His the target, his brother Sam, 
Ned's brother Sam was extremely offended by being accused of breach of trust, which is what he'd been accused of. He was an executor. Because uh, he knew he'd acted in an honorable fashion, he refused it. Because of that, his, uh, his Irish was up, as it were. He refused to settle uh, the case. The case went to trial. Um, the trial was extremely bitter. It was aggressive. And Sam, the uh, target, the adversary, the brother, uh, was put on the witness stand and, and uh, was uh, flailed away at. Uh, after several days of cross-examination, Sam died of a heart attack. Uh, this is all sort of sketched out by um, Noonan in, 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 a, in a really interesting article in the Tennessee Law Review. And uh, um, Ned's story is the story of a man who lost his brother, who never felt the same afterwards, whose lawyer was convinced of the way to go, who was the godfather lawyer. This is not an ethical, this is not a, a, a way to ethical practice in, in, in uh, Schaffer and Cochran's view, nor is, it, uh, nor is it in mind, but it is a frequently seen type of lawyer that's out there. Um, probably the most frequently uh, uh, invoked kind of lawyer is the lawyer who uh, lets the client control, but like the godfather, also believes that only the client's interests count morally, that nobody else's interests count. And uh, that type of lawyer is frequently referred to as uh, a uh, hired gun. Um, so the, the, the goal there is, uh, for the hired gun, is, is uh, autonomy. The, the typical vision that the lawyer expresses is that, you know, it's not for me to impose my values on a client. Uh, any one value is as good as any other value. Autonomy is intrinsically uh, uh, ethically important. And therefore, uh, when, uh, my goal is to further somebody's autonomy by doing what he wants me to do. I wrote an article in the University of Chicago Law Review entitled The Lawyer as Limo. And it was, I, and, and, and it, it, uh, the image being, you know, you get in a limo, you tell the limo driver where you need to go. It's not for the limo driver to advise you on where you should go. The limo driver's dro job is very simple, and that is to take you to that destination. It's a very sort of technical job. He's supposed to have good driving skills, and that's what he's supposed to do. He's not supposed to give you ethical counsel. He's not supposed to consider whether you're going to this location might hurt somebody else, whether you have better things to do with your time than to go to that location, etc. So this is the vision of lawyering that's based on autonomy. The critique of this in a, in, in, in a word, and I, obviously it can't be as long-winded as, I, as, as, I, as we would be together in a legal ethics class on this where we spend hours on this, but the critique is that obviously this could be very bad for others depending on what the hired gun wants you to do. If the hired gun literally wants you to shoot somebody, as in the literal hired gun, that can be bad for the person being shot. Uh, but it's also bad for clients. It deprives them of the lawyer's uh, ethical and moral advice, and it's bad for lawyers. Uh, because at best they live divided lives with one set of morals uh, for the office and another set of morals at home. Uh, at worst, uh, if you believe as I do that you cannot set up a watertight compartment between what you do at work and what you do at home, that there's seepage over time, at worst their own sense of morality ends up atrophying. And, you, and I believe that you do end up seeing exactly the kind of pathology that uh, study after study after study indicates is more rampant today among lawyers than it has ever been in the past. Um, so autonomy as a, as a, as a be-all and end-all uh, is uh, something that I think uh, um, has to be uh, questioned. Um, I'll say this for the question period. Some of you may be, I don't know what everybody's background is. Some of you may be Kantian. This is the, the notion of autonomy that I'm talking about now is not at all Kant's autonomy. So uh, if that becomes uh, relevant, we can talk about that during the... Uh, during the, uh, uh, during the question period. Um, I do think that, by the way, for most people, our most important relationships are relationships of dependence and not of autonomy. And I think that that's interesting. I mean, there is a little bit of what, uh, was it, uh, Janis Joplin or Chris Christofferson or Gordon Lightfoot have all said, and that is that uh, total autonomy, uh, free, total freedom is nothing but another word for uh, nothing left to lose. When you have absolutely nothing, then you are utterly autonomous, but it's not obvious that your life is worth living at that, uh, at that point. Um, so that's the second type of lawyering, is, the, is, the, is, uh, is uh, one called the hired gun. 
Um, the third type of lawyering is the guru. So this is somebody who believes that both the clients and uh, uh, and other interests count. So it's down here. And the control of the relationship lies, the ultimate control of the relationship lies with the attorney. Um, uh, so why have I got a postage stamp of Abraham Lincoln? As a, that's Lincoln as a lawyer um, uh, in that postage stamp as opposed to Lincoln as a politician. Um, there's a whole set of Lincoln stamps that came out and this particular one was Lincoln as an attorney. Um, Lincoln once wrote the following note to a prospective client. Somebody had come to visit him, had interviewed with him, and then Lincoln uh, wrote him the following letter. Didn't, have a, didn't, didn't, didn't speak to him, didn't invite him to come back to the office, but wrote him a letter where he said, quote, we can distress a widowed mother and her six fatherless children and thereby get you $600 to which you seem to have a legal claim, but which rightfully belongs, it appears to me, as much to the woman as to you. You must remember that some things legally right are not morally right. We shall not take your case, but we will give you a little advice for which we will charge you nothing. You seem to be a sprightly, energetic man. We would advise you to try your hand making $600 some other way. Yours, Abraham Lincoln. So um, here the goal is, uh, actually I got sidetracked here and I didn't even write it down. Um, uh, so uh, here the goal is client, uh, here the goal is client rectitude. <coughs> that the client does the right thing that the right thing actually <coughs> occur, that the right result occur. Um, the goal is not dealing with the client as a person. The goal is not, for those of you, again, with philosophical backgrounds, dealing with, um, to use Martin Buber's language, dealing with, the, dealing with the client as a thou. The goal is dealing with the client as an it. Uh, all that matters sort of is the bottom line. Does the widow get sued? or does the widow uh, not get sued? So this is a, um, um, uh, a vision which Schaffer and Cochran, uh, perhaps surprisingly, you might expect them perhaps to applaud this vision, but in fact they don't, nor do I. This is a vision that I think disdains the client as much as the um, uh, godfather disdains the client, um, and therefore, it's, uh, and I think therefore it makes too light of the fact that the lawyer actually has an extremely important relationship and that it's ethically important for him to have that relationship with the client as opposed to being some kind of social worker working to maximize some social, some social good. And um, the fourth, obviously, and the one that they find and I find uh, uh, ethically preferable, the hardest one uh, to perfect um, is, is what they call the lawyer as friend, not to be confused with what another a different scholar once called the lawyer as friend in a, in a law review article. And that, that um, anyway, for those of you who've read that, another article that is entitled the lawyer as friend, that friend is more like the hired gun. That, um, um, yeah. But this friend is somebody whose goal is fairly complex. The goal is not the bottom line. The goal is not um, um, victory or whatever the client wants or the right social thing. Rather, the goal is, to, is, is, is sage counsel, is, French, is uh, fr friendship in the sense of interacting ethically with a client, perhaps the client will end up being a slightly, becoming a slightly better person. Perhaps you will be, be a slightly better person. Just think of the way you all interact with friends. Just the, uh, uh, you may give your friend uh, advice. You may the friend may listen to you. The friend may not end up following your advice. That's fine, unless what the friend does is so abhorrent that it ends the friendship. Um, you're prepared to accept friends who don't think exactly what you do about things, but they value your friendship and they value your counsel. You're treating them as a thou and not as an it. A very important English bishop in the 17th century um, uh, wrote the following about uh, counsel to a friend. He said, give thy friend counsel wisely and charitably, but leave him to his liberty, whether he will follow thee or not, and be not angry if thy counsel be rejected. He that gives advice to his friend and exacts obedience to it, 
that, that would be the guru. There's not the kindness and ingenuity of a friend, but the office and pertness of a schoolmaster. Um, so, um, uh, the lawyer as friend has a kind of detachment, a sympathetic kind of detachment, not the kind of detachment that the hired gun has. The friend, like the hired gun, gives ultimate choice to the client, but unlike the hired gun, do whatever the hell you want, I'll just, you know, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it, I'm your gun. Uh, that's not what a friend does. A friend does interact, a friend does try to get counsel, but a friend also has this kind of sympathetic uh, detachment uh, uh, to a problem. And that's a really interesting article in the uh, Nebraska Law Review, if you can see it down there. Like I said, I'm, I'm often want to just sort of include these kinds of things if anybody's interested in taking this any further. Um, okay. So now let me talk uh, for the rest of uh, my talk today about Atticus Finch. Um, <clears throat> Atticus uh, is, I'm sure every single person here admires Atticus. Uh, I certainly am among those uh, people. He's a, 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 a classic hero. Uh, he is a father, uh, as you know, a, a, a widower, so a single father, a, a wonderful uh, and caring uh, father. He's a defender of uh, the weak. He is a man of tremendous um, integrity. Uh, he believes that he has to be the same man at home and at work. That's a constant theme of the book, and you can see it in the movie as well. Um, there's a very famous, uh, a, a, a memorable uh, inter uh, interchange with his daughter, Scout, that goes something like this. Scout says, if you shouldn't be defending him, then why are you doing it, uh, apropos Tom Robinson? For a number of reasons, said Atticus, the main one is, if I didn't, I couldn't hold up my head in town, I couldn't represent this county in the legislature, I couldn't even tell you or Jem to do something again. You mean if you didn't defend that man, Jem and me wouldn't have to mind you anymore? That's about right. Why? Because I could never ask you to mind me again. So to Atticus, this notion of integrity <coughs> being the same man at home or at work, the exact opposite of the hired gun who sees a total dichotomy between, between what he might be at home or at work is sort of extremely um, uh, important. And I uh, remind you that after this was all over, Atticus was actually re-elected unanimously, as amazing as that seems, to the state legislature, the unanimous vote being relevant because, of course, uh, lots of folks in the town seemed to be very much opposed to what he was doing um, in defending Tom Robinson. Um, but they knew what kind of man they had there. So he's a sort of a, a, true, a, a true hero. Um, I might interject that there's another way in which Atticus, uh, it's politically incorrect, and so uh, apologies if any of you are, none of you should be offended by this, but there's a wonderful book called Manliness by Harvey Mansfield, a Harvard uh, uh, philosophy, uh, political science, uh, political theory professor. Uh, came out in 2007. I highly recommend this book. It tries to distinguish between ridiculous macho versions of manliness and what manliness really stands for. And Atticus Finch, I think, is the was the quintessential manly man. Um, he's the man who did the job that nobody else wanted to do, as we know, the job of defending Tom Robinson. He's a man who lives every single day with integrity, never a day when he sort of lets his hair down and goes on a bender, uh, behaves, you know, uh, casually, um, um, outside when the, when the clock is stopped, but rather he lives with integrity 24-7. A man is courageous, and the most important form of, cor of courage is uh, moral courage, which obviously Atticus has in spades. And a man masters manly skills. For example, you see there, uh, this is the famous scene of Atticus um, with the rabbit dog that I, that I pictured there, but lives with humility. Nobody ever knew, his children never even knew what a crack shot he was. One shot Atticus was his nickname, you may recall, because he never needed more than one shot to accomplish anything he wanted to accomplish. He, he, comp he lived with humility and quiet dignity, never self-aggrandizing, but he was able to do what a man had to do when a man had to do it. So Atticus is truly a, a, an admirable character. Uh, and yet Atticus, um, I'm going to criticize Atticus, but before I criticize Atticus, I want to give you two kinds of criticism of Atticus that have been made by others and with which I disagree. So I'd like to defend 
if you will, Atticus against two different kinds of criticism first, and then I will level my own criticism. One, uh, uh, to my mind, almost astounding criticism was made in a Law Review article in a prominent Law Review in 1999. And that article went something like this. I almost called it, I, I call it their virtually nihilistic scholarship. It suggested that, uh, oops, the, the, that Tom Robinson may have been guilty, after all, of rape. That Atticus may have sullied the name and the reputation of the rape victim, Mayella uh, Ewell, in order to get uh, his uh, rapist uh, client off the hook. This would, this would make uh, uh, this would make Atticus the quintessential godfather. Um, he's destroyed the reputation of an innocent person to let a guilty man to get a guilty man off the hook. The quintessential godfather. Um, I, I, I deeply believe I can't. I don't have time to go into this today, but I deeply believe that that makes a shambles of the book. And, and I generally believe, as a uh, uh, and Professor Blackman has taken my jurisprudence seminar with me, which talks about this that. Um, um, an interpretation that makes a shambles of a work tends to be less persuasive as an interpretation than an interpretation that gives meaning to the whole work. And this interpretation, in my view, makes shambles of the entire work. But Atticus constantly shows he's not a godfather. He exhibits tremendous respect for people other than his client constantly. He insists on integrity. He keeps insisting that he's got to be the same person at the office as he is at home, and this would be entirely a fraud. It would make a shambles, uh, I think, of the entire book. The book gives, of course, multiple, multiple clues to the actual innocence of Tom Robinson. There was never a rape kit done. Uh, there, was, there isn't what we would ever call any evidence of intercourse uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this rape charge, and there is uh, plenty of evidence of um, that the outside the bruises by Mayla Ewell were actually uh, incurred at the hands of her father and not at the hands of any, uh, of any rapist. Plenty of evidence like that. There's no like behavior by Tom of any violence. It's true he did defend himself in a fight years earlier and a racist judge sentenced him to 30 days when he defended himself in a fight, but there's no evidence of any sexual aggression of any kind towards anybody by Tom. Atticus, Atticus was concerned to down the rabid dog in one shot. Atticus, Atticus was concerned not to torture the dog. Very concerned about that. He's not going to torture Mayella Ewell, an innocent person. Uh, I do believe that this is the, the, the only reason that that 1999 article even had a surface plausibility was that there is, there, in some circles, I think that there is a belief that there could never ever be a false rape accusation. Um, that is, that, that, that if a rape accusation has been made, there must have been a rape. Uh, and I, I do believe that, that, that I, I, I don't believe that that's necessarily true, and I certainly believe that in this case it lacks uh, supporting evidence. Um, I don't think that that critique, uh, so, so my critique of Tom, of uh, Atticus has nothing to do with that one. I don't think that one's much worthy of our attention. Another one is more interesting and gets closer to what I have in mind. And this requires that I talk to you a little bit about the difference between the book and the movie. So let me just ask, for a show of hands, who's read the book, even if it's years ago? Okay, who's seen the movie? Okay, so probably 90% of you have read the book, and it looks like about 70% of you have seen the movie, uh, as I have done both, too, so that's, that's good. Um, Atticus seems to exhibit, in the, let me talk about the book now, Atticus exhibits a tremendous respect as a lawyer for the truth. Um, I'll get into this later, talking about his relationship with uh, Tom uh, Robinson. Um, one interesting question that we should all raise, as a, I certainly raise with my legal ethics students, and I'm sure that your, your professors must do so with you all, and that is, um, is it ever moral, ethical for a lawyer to lie, or for a lawyer to countenance a lie? Should one always tell the truth as an ethical matter? Does one tell the Gestapo which way the Jew went if the Gestapo officer asks? Is it ever ethical to lie? That's an interesting question. We explored it in some detail in my legal ethics class. I'm not going to explore it with you now except to talk with you about chapter 30, the very end of this book. 
So, since you, this is no spoiler alert, because you've all read the book, right? Okay. So, um, as you know, after the trial was over, after what happened to Tom happened to Tom, um, um, uh, during a little uh, children's art show, the children were accosted by uh, uh, Bob Ewell, and um, uh, Bob Ewell ended up dying uh, during the night at the end of, uh, after this. And um, Atticus, uh, in this chapter, which is the penultimate chapter of the book, Atticus, uh, and he died at the hands uh, of a person whom we would today uh, call uh, an autistic person. But he didn't have that, they didn't have uh, words like that to describe, um, to describe people at the time. Um, I'm, I'm halfway through this, 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 this last chapter. Sheriff, Sheriff Tate is talking to Atticus. Sheriff Tate says, it was like this. He said, he held the knife and pretended to stumble. As he leaned forward, his left arm went down in front of him. See there, stabbed himself through that soft stuff between his ribs. His whole weight drove it in. He's saying, Bob Ewell stabbed himself, fell on his knife. Atticus, uh, uh, Mr. Tate closed the knife and jammed it back in his pocket. Scout's eight years old. She was too scared to know exactly what went on. I think Scout had given a slightly different version of events to her father. You'd be surprised, Atticus said. I'm not saying she made it up. I'm saying she was too scared to know exactly what happened. It was mighty dark out there, black as ink. It takes somebody mighty used to the dark to make a competent witness. I won't have it, Atticus said softly. God damn it, I'm not thinking of Jim. Atticus at this point thinks that Jem has stabbed Bob Ewell in defense of his sister and that Jem must now stand trial and be acquitted, but must now stand trial. Atticus does not know, heck knows, that it was somebody else who stabbed Bob Ewell. They go on. They have a long conversation. Heck ends up saying, I'm not a very good man, sir, but I am sheriff of Macomb County. Lived in this town all my life, and I'm going on 43 years old. <coughs> know everything that's happened here since uh, before I was born. There's a black boy dead for no reason, and the man responsible for it's dead. Let the dead bury the dead this time, Mr. Finch. Let the dead bury the dead. And Atticus has a kind of a transformation at this point. And there's a paragraph where you can see all sorts of things being absorbed. And I'm going to talk about what those things are in just a minute. All sorts of things are being absorbed. And, he, and, and, and Tate then continues and says, I may not be much, Mr. Finch, but I'm still sheriff of Macomb County, and Bob Ewell fell on his knife. Good night, sir. And then Scout come Come, approaches her dad, and her dad says, Scout, finally, for a long time they're silent, and then Atticus raises his head to, the, to his daughter and says, Scout, Mr. Ewell fell on his knife, can you possibly understand? And Scout says, yes sir, I understand, Mr. Tate is right, even though obviously Scout had described something very different. What do you mean, Atticus says. Well, it'd sort of be like shooting a mockingbird, wouldn't it? Obviously, the idea being that this autistic man who craved privacy to put him forefront and put him on trial would be to shatter him. And therefore, Bob Ewell fell on his knife. This is not the truth. Atticus knows it's not the truth, and Atticus tells his daughter that this is what happened. Okay. This is not what was in the movie. Because the National Legion of Decency, which was uh, an arm, I say was, I'm, I don't know if it still exists, it was uh, an arm of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, said that it would refuse to um, approve of this movie. And it would tell all of its members to boycott the movie if the movie contained that scene. 
in the movie version of To Kill a Mockingbird, Sheriff Tate at the end says, Bob Ewell fell on his knife, do you understand? And Atticus says, no, I don't understand. And he remains silent as Sheriff Tate whispers the lie to everybody else. In other words, Atticus remains faithful to the truth all of the time. Truth is the ultimate value. That's not the Atticus Finch that's in the book. The, Atticus, the, the critique of Atticus that the National Legion of Decency leveled is a critique that I absolutely resist. <clears throat> I think the book version is an admirable Atticus on this account. Atticus clearly prefers truth to a lie, but maturely has now come to realize, now I'll get to this in just a minute, I think that's, this is the point of the whole, the whole point of the book, has now come to realize that uh, uh, Boo uh, 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 Radley will be hurt by the truth, devastated by the truth, and he, an innocent person, and he accepts this. Atticus, I think, acts as a friend to Boo Radley. Atticus would have preferred one thing, but Atticus realizes that that's not what should be done, and Atticus has uh, relaxed his insistence on the truth um, in favor of um, the um, desires of his client. So, having defended Atticus against two different grounds of criticism, let me level my own. Atticus was not always a friend. <coughs> Atticus became a friend at the end of the book, and I think that's the meaning of the book. I think that's part of the beauty of this book. But Atticus was not always a friend. Um, In chapter 9 of the book, and the book has 30 chapters, uh, so early on in the book, uh, Scout asks uh, her dad, Attic as you remember, uh, the children used his first name, Atticus, are we going to win it? And Atticus Finch answers Scout, no, honey, we're not going to win it. Atticus believed that the conviction of Tom Robinson for rape, which was at that time a capital offense in that state, was inevitable. I want to wonder with you whether that conviction was inevitable, the conviction of an innocent man, the conviction of a truly just man, was inevitable or was only inevitable given Atticus's lawyering philosophy. So that's what I want to talk about for a bit. Atticus, in my view, quite clearly was not a friend to Tom Robinson. Atticus, in my view, quite clearly was a guru attorney to Tom Robinson. Tom never was consulted about the way that the uh, representation, that his representation, by the way, I think Brock Peters' uh, movie uh, representation of Tom Robinson was one of the best acting roles I've ever seen in my life. But, that, but, but the, the, uh, Tom was never involved in uh, understanding or uh, developing his own uh, defense. Um, Tom was a passive recipient, treated childlike in a childlike way, I think, by Atticus. And I'll go further. Atticus had an idea of what rectitude was, and that rectitude did not involve the welfare of Tom Robinson. So this is this is like some some, some kind of social welfare, and uh, typical of the guru attorney. Um, let me refer you to, uh, uh, there were scenes in the book and in the movie, quite a few scenes, where Atticus says to Tom, you know you've got to tell the truth. You know, we, we know you're innocent and you're going to tell the truth. We're going to win this. Although he told his daughter that they're not going to win this much earlier on. During the, I'm now in chapter 19. In, cross, in direct examination of his, of, uh, of his uh, client, um, he uh, uh, asks Tom, Tom, what happened to you on the evening of November 21st of last year? And which, of course, was the was the uh, night of the alleged uh, of the alleged rape. And he starts describing how he's walking by, and he's asked to um, do a job to fix a door um, uh, by Maya like you will. And he went in to fix a door, and determined that the door didn't need any fixing. And, well, I said I'd best be going. I couldn't do nothing for her. And she says, oh, yes, I could. And I ask her what. And she says, 
to just step on that chair yonder and get that box down from on top of the chiffero. Uh, and so he gets the chair, he puts the chair, on, uh, he stands on top of the chair to get something down. And then, and the tension's building, I can't portray it here because I don't have the time to read you several pages, but the tension's building. And Atticus asks Tom, what happened after you turned the chair over? So he gets down, he gets the thing on top of the chair, having turned the chair upside down, I guess, to stand on it in some way. And then he, 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 he gets down, turns the chair over, and then it says, Tom Robinson came to a dead stop. He glanced at Atticus. He glanced at, jur at the jury. At Tom Robinson did not want to speak. And then Atticus says to Tom, Tom, you're sworn to tell the truth. Do you remember what we talked about? Will you tell it? And in the movie, of course, you can see uh, the Robinson character absolutely sweating bullets, sweating profusely. He knows what he is about. He, is, he has been ordered by his lawyer to tell the truth. And he knows that telling the truth is going to put a noose around his neck because he knows that the truth is going to be that he was attractive to a white woman, which at that time, in that place, is absolutely taboo and does not allow him to continue living there. So Tom ran, ran his hand nervously over his mouth. He still wouldn't talk. What happened? And then the judge says, answer the question. And then he, he goes on and says, she reached up and kissed me on the side of the face. She says she never kissed a grown man before, and she might as well kiss a nigger. She said, she says what her papa do to her don't count afterward. It don't count. So her papa does stuff, but that doesn't count. She says, kiss me back, nigger. I say, Miss Mayella, let me out of here. And I tried to run, but she got her back to the door, and I had to, I had to push her. He, in many ways, has sealed her fate. I believe that Atticus knew that he had sealed her fate. He would seal his fate by saying this truth. And I believe that that's why Atticus told his daughter that, the, that they were going to lose this trial. He knew, he read, he knew what the jury, he knew about the taboos, he knew that the jury could not tolerate this kind of, uh, the existence of this kind of person. Uh, similarly, uh, Tom, uh, you may recall a very poignant, uh, by the way, um, uh, both the Boo Radley character and the D.A. Gilmer character were portrayed by, by, by actors who became quite famous. Uh, and, and, and for both of them, this is the very first time they ever, they ever acted. Um, in the, you, you recall that um, um, the D.A. asked Tom, why did you go in to help this woman? And he didn't want to answer, and he pushed Tom, why did you want to help this woman? And finally he says, I had pity for her. I felt sorry for her. And he explodes. You, and he says, you felt sorry for a white woman? You felt sorry for a white woman. This is an absolute taboo. This, this inverses the hierarchy that the population believes must exist. Um, this condemns Tom, and I think that it was known. So this insistence on the truth. Now, did he have alternatives? I think he did have alternatives. He insisted on Tom telling the truth. The truth killed Tom. He humiliated Mayella Ewell and Bob Ewell. Well, right, they truthfully humiliated Mayella and Bob, uh, and Bob Ewell by bringing out their perfidy in, their, in, his, in Atticus's cross-examination. Did he have any choices? I'd submit to you he had plenty of choices. Let me give you one, one example, and I'll give you a second one on the next slide. One example, he could have said to Mayella, and especially to her dad. I'm taking this defense seriously. This isn't pro forma. If we have this trial, I'm going to have it revealed that she tried to seduce a black man. She's never going to be available for, any, she's never going to be marriageable to any white man in this county ever again. She's going to be dirt, and you're going to be even worse dirt than you are right now. What you have to do is go to the sheriff and make up something. Um, oh, it was some other guy who it wasn't, I, I just realized it wasn't Tom. It was somebody else from out of, uh, some stranger who did it. Did he have, 
instead, what he insisted on was that the truth come forward. I'll go a little quickly here. Second example. He's in the prison. He's in front of the jail. You may recall they had moved uh, uh, Tom to the local jail, and and uh, a bunch of clansmen came to lynch him. He was uh, Atticus himself was uh, saved uh, by the fortuitous arrival of his of his daughter. But um, um, I'm wondering. But Atticus did not subvert. After this was all, Atticus knew his client was going to be condemned. Did he, should he have helped his client escape, for example? Should he have told? Uh, should he have knocked himself on the head and told the world that Tom knocked him on the head? Would he have had at least a chance to get out of the county with his family? Who knows? Maybe he would have. There have been plenty of lawyers that have done such things. In my county, Montgomery County, Maryland, a very famous attorney was a guy named Jacob Bigelow, an attorney in Rockville, Maryland, who was instrumental in getting, in illegally, totally illegally getting slaves out of Maryland uh, and up into Pennsylvania through the Underground Railroad. And he was an attorney, an officer of the court, and he subverted the law this way. Uh, there were many lawyers involved in Valkyrie, which was the which was the plot to kill Adolf Hitler. Ma many German lawyers involved in the plot to kill Adolf Hitler. Obviously, totally contrary to the laws of uh, Germany at the time. Uh, was this a, a, a case where subversion was ethical? Atticus knew his client was innocent. Atticus knew his client was going to be convicted. Atticus knew that there was the death penalty. Uh, sh uh, uh, but Atticus didn't bother to think about this because Atticus was utterly devoted to the truth. And the truth helped Atticus in a way. Atticus was elected, re-elected unanimously. The people of Maycomb knew that they, were, that they were venal and they knew that they knew. They knew that they knew. He had shown it. He had put it in there. He had rubbed it in their face. He had helped the progress of Maycomb, of Maycomb Alabama. Um, he had furthered the progress of Maycomb, Alabama, but he had done so at the cost of uh, 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 the life and the welfare of his client. So I'd submit to you that at the end of the book, Atticus saw this, and that is why he connived in the lie to save Boo Radley. He realized that he should be a friend. The Atticus during the book was an Atticus that had not yet sufficiently evolved. I think he was... Uh, a good-hearted, a well-meaning, but a flawed lawyer. Sorry I've gone over, but... Thank you so much. Mr. Crowder? Mr. Do you want to come up here? Um, <clears throat> sure. Make way, please. Mm -hmm. When Professor Blackman asked me to comment, I originally thought that he was doing me a favor, and then I took a look at Professor Krause's resume, and I decided that as a junior professor here, he was just going to try to get me removed from the faculty to open up a position. Um, I think I may be able to say one or two things. Uh, perhaps bringing my unique perspective to bear. Uh, one trick today for law professors is if you want to avoid any criticism, what I'm really worried about is not what I'm saying, but what Professor Krauss may say about what I'm saying. Uh, one trick as a law professor is to engage in narrative, to just explain to you from my personal background what appears to me to be the truth. And that way, if I'm just drawing on my personal background and not using law and stuff, then Professor Krauss can't say anything bad about me, or he is demeaning me as a person. <laughs> and so all of this is just, I can also get published in the Harvard Law Review if I do that, but that's a different subject. Um, so I just want to bring to this my unique perspective as a black man and as a successful criminal defense attorney. Um, now, anyone who knows anything about me may be <laughs> surprised, uh, possibly even more by my description of myself as a successful criminal defense, defense attorney than as a black man. It's true, though. When I was asked to talk about this, I tried to think back, you know, when did I first read To Kill a Mockingbird? And it was my uh, sophomore year in high school. And 
for me, it wasn't law. I never wanted to be a lawyer. It was my first exposure to race relations. I grew up in the frozen north, a small town in North Dakota. The oppressed minority group was the German Catholics. The majority was the German Protestants. And I am, I don't think I ever saw a black person, and I certainly never engaged in conversation with one until I went to college. And reading To Kill a Mockingbird gave me, I don't know, something about it, it is true. The book is true. I don't care what people say about us being fiction. It happened. That's the only feeling I can get from reading the book. It is just about the most powerful fiction I've ever read. And it was an eye-opening experience. I did not understand the civil rights movement. We had busing, but it was busing to get the farm kids in from the country. And I didn't imagine that we could do anything like that up north. That this sort of prejudice was the South. And then was my junior year. And we put on up the down staircase as the school play, which calls for a minor character of Edward Williams Esquire, a black militant. And so I became a black militant for three evenings. The grease paint had to be ordered from Chicago. And I was a black with an afro for three days. It was the closest my town had ever come to it. And what we heard afterwards, which just shocked me, was that the second day of the performance, some folks from out of town came in and didn't know that I was just wearing grease paint and went ballistic at the thought that uh, you know Valley City, North Dakota was integrating its schools and they hadn't even seen it in time to stop it from happening. The I, when I get down south, you know, I look, get to learn a little bit about the real South, and I can't say anything about its truthfulness from personal experience, but I did marry a genuine Southern Belle who grew up in a very small town, and she assures me that it could have happened, every bit of it, in her town, except maybe that there was no attorney as brave as Atticus Finch. Um, her grandmother, by the way, so the family story has, has her original date of birth changed on the birth certificate, otherwise it would have been the same as Lincoln's uh, birthday. <laughs> anyway, it's real. I absolutely agree with Professor Krauss that uh, Professor LeVay's uh, approach is uh, not worth commenting on seriously. But you got to understand law reviews are written by students, and you never get an article published if you say what everyone else in the world has said. So you have to pick something outrageous, and that enhances tremendously your chances of being in print. And then, if everyone thinks you're a fool, they cite your article to say what a fool you are, and your citation count goes up. And it becomes, it must be an influential article because it's cited a whole bunch. I don't know about this stuff that Atticus could have done a better trial, though. And here's where my career as a criminal defense attorney comes in a little bit, although it's more about whether it was moral for Atticus to engage in a lie afterwards. That's the usual diss on Atticus, that, uh, that he compromised his truth-telling by agreeing to go along with the sheriff. My criminal defense experience, by the way, I have an undefeated record. Uh, one <coughs> Class B misdemeanor case uh, defending a relative who, as he put it, didn't have enough money for a real lawyer. <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a simple assault that never happened. Uh, there was a jury, and I've been assured that because the jury was actually impaneled, it counts as a trial. <laughs> The complaining witness began to testify. I took her on cross-examination. And uh, she wasn't doing well on remembering, like, anything. And we took a break for lunch. After lunch, 
the prosecutor came back and simply stood up and announced to the jury that the prosecution was dismissing the case and that that was a prosecutor's job. And if a prosecutor couldn't believe that it was right to be prosecuting, that was what it was ethical for a prosecutor to do, to handle the argument about Atticus going along with the sheriff. I'm not sure a sheriff is supposed to arrest, maybe so, even when he thinks that there's not really been a, a crime committed. But I would certainly think if Atticus had been a prosecutor, he would have been perfectly justified in refusing ever to take that case to court. Not just because Boo would have been uh, humiliated and possibly uh, harmed permanently, but because he shouldn't have taken it to court. It wasn't a crime. And of course, Atticus wasn't representing anyone there. And so I think he's got considerably more ethical grounds uh, than during trial. Could Atticus have tried the case any differently? I think not. If I, want to, if I blame anyone at all for what happened in this case, it's Tom Robinson. You know, Atticus was trying a case that, so far as I can see, was a beautiful case in terms of creating a record, a record for an appeal. And that's what appellate courts exist for, to some extent, to correct the excesses of trial. And the southern courts, particularly federal courts at the appellate level at that time, did have a pretty good record, at least comparatively speaking, for enforcing civil rights better than the trial courts did. Less local prejudice, less swayed by concern about personal blowback. You know, the ultimate desegregation of the South, the 60s, it was the, the three horsemen of the Fifth Circuit, um, Wisdom, Tuttle, and Brown, federal appellate judges, all Southern gentlemen, who made it come about. What Tom was doing, like I said, is making a record. You don't yell and scream and orate when you know you're probably going to lose anyway. What you do is you make your points. You get your evidence in. You line things up correctly. If there was any way of showing that Tom was convicted against the evidence, that was it. Additionally, if he had a chance at trial, the only chance at trial he was going to have was by the truth. And it was possible to appeal to something that worked at that time. It was not unknown in the South that blacks and whites would have sexual relations. You can go back even to the times of slavery and find cases for divorce where the white man asked for divorce because his wife had been intimate with slaves. It happened. But what he had to do with Southern feelings at the time was to convince the jury that this woman really was the instigator he had to make her into poor white trash. Respectable women didn't take up with blacks. But disrespectable women, disreputable women, that happened. People knew it happened. The only way to do it was by destroying her reputation. And in this case, her reputation undoubtedly deserved to be destroyed. Could he have gone to the father, and uh, who is it, Luella? Luella Luetta? Mayella. Mayella, okay. Could he have gone to the father of Mayella and changed anyone's mind? I don't think so. I think, in fact, and I think we agree, that she was being sexually abused by her father, who was unbalanced and violent. we got to remember, this is long before women's shelters, long before women could run away and get a job. She was completely dependent on her father, bad though he might be. And she was most concerned, and apparently justifiably so, about being beaten to death or within an inch of her life. 
by her father. That attempt would have at least left her at huge risk to her father. I don't think she could have agreed publicly or privately. What, what Atticus did was cruel, but it was what he had to do. And, uh, oh, for, for those who don't know, one reason that the story sounds so true is, of course, that it is in large part true. Uh, Harper Lee was the little girl scout. Her father did try, was a lawyer, did try the case uh, of some black men accused, probably not nearly as dramatic. But you also had the Scottsboro trials, which then were quite recent. And remember, the Scottsboro boys got a better shake on appeal, uh, so to speak, than they ever got a trial. Um, it really was the way things were. You have time for a question? Oh, hold it, hold it. Totally forgot one other thing. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. You know, there's a lot of myths about Lincoln. Stories that grew up that aren't true. And the notion of, I won't take this case because you ought to handle it informally, is not one of those stories. It's perfectly true, and I just want to give you for coming to visit Thank you. a book on Abraham Lincoln by Appreciate Professor that. Steiner of our faculty, which is the best thing in existence. Thank you. And I marked it as the chapter where he tells about other things Lincoln did Thank you. to show that he didn't care for the money. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Professor Pass, Professor Paulson, yes, sir. I, I just have a few questions to do about uh, first the diagram up there. Um, I, um, I, Let me try to actually get you a better one there. I'll, just, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't read this book, so right. my questions are answered in it. But it seems almost too rigid and artificial to sort of construction of uh, this. You still have this dichotomy that I think is somewhat false dichotomy between a lawyer versus client control in this relationship. Um, it could, couldn't it be in some sense more fluid than that? I mean, because in any relationship, you're not, you, at least I, you shouldn't have just simply one dominant partner versus one completely passive partner sure. in a relationship. So, I mean, going back to this Atticus Finch, Atticus Finch and Tom Robinson model that um, we're talking about, you know, perhaps Tom Robinson didn't want the truth to be revealed because it would implicate him against the town. Um, but Atticus thought that it was better to reveal the truth because otherwise Tom Robinson's credibility would have taken a hit, and it was better for it to be put on record, as Professor Paulson has argued, for a case for appeal, whereas if it wasn't put on record, sure, and these issues weren't brought to light, even though Tom Robinson may have had misgivings about it, it would have been to his detriment in the long run. I mean, even as um, sure John Stuart Mill argued in his, in, you know, the grand against paternal.